You have web browsed and net surfed your way to Behind the Buzz, a public fit theater company's occasional podcast detailing, discussing, dissecting, and just plain talking about the production processes that go into putting together our season of plays and stage readings. And look, look at us. This is episode number one of season number three. I mean, who would have thunk it? Uh, I'm APF producing director Joe Kukin, and I'm joined as always by APF's artistic director, Anne-Marie Perreth. Hi there. Hello. And today uh, we'll be talking about Jane Martin's Pulitzer Prize finalist uh, play, Keely and Do, with director Adrian Shoker. It kicks off our 2022 slash... 23 season and we're ecstatic to be continuing our partnership with the Las Vegas Clark County Library District with Keely and Do opening at the Flamingo Library for one performance only on Friday, September 30th. Uh, the doors will open at 6.30 for a 7 p.m. start time and though admission is free, we highly suggest getting there a bit early just to snap up the really good seats. Um, and if that's not enough info for you, check us out at apublicfit.org for more. But first, uh, AM. Um, you know, we, we, we started this podcast as a response to the, uh, what, inactivity, I guess, that we are forced to face uh, during the pandemic. And, you know, we, we had a bit of a debate uh, this, this year on whether or not to continue. But here we are. And, you know, why is that? Why are we here again? Why are we back with another season of behind the buzz does it speak to a theater company's mandate uh i would believe so i mean i know it's not quite journalism but <laughs> that's, that's for sure <laughs> with a capital j i know <laughs> theatrical journalism but my favorite way of receiving information is actually through a po podcast more so than tv right? more so than on the radio i like the I like podcasting because you can save up episodes, you can listen to them throughout the day on your own on your own time. And so I just like the idea of podcasting and the way you get information. I really f feel like it, it, it helps uh, me in a lot of ways with my vocabulary, with my understanding of the world, my understanding of other people, depending on the topic. So I just like the idea of podcasting. Also, I like... Um, APF's podcast because I really love analyzing plays. I love to get to know the directors. I love to get to know the playwrights. I like to hear their perspective. Yeah, And it's one of my favorite things that we do um, is just to sit around and, and talk with the different people that we're working with over the season. Uh, and I think that's why we decided to continue it. Well, and you know, our byline is compelling stories continuing conversations and I think that that you know really putting a big broad underscore uh, you know under conversation is, is not a, a bad thing and I'll also point out you know you and I um, are in rehearsals with another play right now and we have four um, uh, very strong uh, I, I want to say young new you know dynamic directors taking the readings on um, because we can't be there all the time so I find these conversations you know these behind the buzz conversations um, really illuminating because we're not there for all the rehearsals. We're not there for the whole process. I was really glad that I went to rehearsal the other uh, night to watch uh, Adrian's work and the cast work so that I could actually talk about right? the play on this podcast. Well, let's start with that. You know, as long as we're, we're going to start with talking about the play, let's talk about the play. This okay. is, you know, you, you spend a lot of time. We sit down and look at a lot of scripts, mm -hmm. uh, you and I, over the course of the year. And But you were really, this was one that you were really adamant about producing this year. Keely and Do. Uh, by by Jane Martin. You want to talk about why? Well, I think it's super timely. I mean, big spoiler alert, it's about uh, two factions of thinking. Uh, uh, one faction of thinking is an individual woman. She wants to have an abortion. And the other faction of thinking is that there's a group of people who have decided that they want to, to save the child. And that's a subject matter that's a very hot topic in our news today because of the overturning of Roe v. Wade. So I thought it would be a nice way to open our season uh, and also a nice way for our audience to actually discuss this issue in a peaceful way. Well, that's a question I w I'm going to bring that up later. I'm glad you said that. And mm -hmm. remember, remind me that you that you said that. Have this There's conversation in a peaceful way because I think that's an important part of the of, the, of this conversation. Also, there's another thing that I, I really noticed in rehearsal the other day, um, that once you get to the heart of the play, it's really, I think all good stories, the, um, 
good plays are actually about love. And I know that seems very Pollyanna-ish, but we're um, part of the human experience and love is very important in order to be part of that human experience. And I think this is a play about love. And in the case of of Keeley, um, she is a woman, spoiler alert, who has been raped. Uh, She wants to take care of her father who is ill and she has decided to honor her, honor herself by having an abortion, not because she wants to have an abortion, but that is just the best thing for her set of circumstances. So she's showing, it's like an act of love towards herself because she understands um, that that is not good for her or for the future of, of this particular. And, and, and now you know that there are people out there who are going to disagree with that perspective. Yes. That that act is an act of love. You, you are going to get a lot of pushback on that, just so you're aware. Exactly. But then on the other side of it in the story, there's another character. Her name is Dew, and she's uh, been a nurse, what it seems like for most of her life. She's a person who cares for other people, and she cares a lot about about children, and she cares about the potential of that baby. Yeah. And so in her mind, it's an act of love in order to save the baby, right? Sure. And so... We have two, two competing acts of love. Two competing acts of love. And, and then I think somewhere in the story, these women start to actually appreciate or love each other. Sure. And that's what makes it a very compelling story right. to me. And, and that's what I saw in the rehearsal process. Well, let me, I, I see her chomping at the bit. It's not fair that you and I are doing this. Let's get, let's get Adrian involved here. I want to introduce uh, Adrian Shoker. Adrian Shoker is directing Keely and do for us. And, you know, Adrian is a, is a freelance director, acting teacher, private coach, I'm assuming of baseball uh, and <laughs> business uh, maestro. She's a graduate of East 15 acting school in London, England. I, I always giggle when it's London, England. I, Cause you know, like, where's another London? Yeah, it's not, England, just, it's not yeah. London, New Hampshire. Right. I digress. Um, and she earned her MFA in theater directing from that school in London, England. Most recently, she assistant directed, prop mastered, and choreographed VTC's production of The Witch. And uh, also recently, she's devised a comedic short for Sun City players called In the Bag. Her, her daytime mortgage jobs include creating a series of unending spreadsheets for Piff the Magic Dragon and teaching a course in acting out at the College of Southern Nevada. Adrian, welcome, and thanks for coming out and talking with us. Well, thank you for having me. So you heard Emery chat a little bit about the, the play and its sort of dueling love interests. Did that did that strike a chord with you? Of course. Everything Anne-Marie says strikes a chord with me. <laughs> she so. is pretty wise. Oh, my God. <laughs> Can, um, you, can you come over tomorrow morning? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and help course. me start my day. <laughs> <laughs> I have a little thing for you later I'll, I'll share with you. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, it is at its heart a relationship slash love play. Uh, the other reason that I think it's so appropriate for right now is, and Anne Marie pretty much said this, but I'll, I'm going to say it in a little bit of a different way. Sure. But. Um, I realized actually today that the play is um, really representative of the divisive nature of our culture and society right now. Yeah. So it doesn't really matter what the issue is. It could be abortion. It could be climate change. It could be, um, you know, immigration. Pick a topic. In, pick a topic. And I think it's a really great example of how divisive we are right now. So I found that very interesting because it, it's really two extreme views. Well, you, you, you said that this sort of occurred to you today. What, yeah. what, tell me about your initial reactions to the play. I mean, we'll get back to that. I think that's a, a, a really interesting topic. But I'm really curious about how you as, as a, a woman, and in some ways I have to say I feel a little um, uncomfortable leading a discussion where we talk about uh, you know, women's reproductive rights. I'm a, a, a middle-aged white guy, and right. you know, my... my opinion on the subject may not be that important now my import my opinion on theater I'll, I'll back that up every time my opinion on how the play is to be presented okay let's chat about that but in terms of the the, the real nitty-gritty of the subject matter um, I worry sometimes that that us old white guys may be taking up too much of the space in the room so I wonder about your initial reaction to the play not just as a theater artist but but as, as, a, as a woman right um I would say I had a very strong reaction. Yeah. Um, 
you know, I'm a child of the 60s. Sure. So kind of grew up with all of the turmoil and, and you know, feminist movement and all that kind of stuff surrounding me. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I had a very strong reaction to it. It's... Um, what was it that moved you the most? What, where did you feel like it poked at you the most? I would say really just the relationship between the two women and the two different viewpoints, but how how ultimately they they find a common ground. And the again, the abortion for me was is upsetting. And the playwright tries really hard, I suppose, to balance the scales as much as he, she could as we don't really know who Jane Martin is. Um, well, let's, you know what? I'm sorry. I, uh, let's talk about that a little bit. Can we talk about the pseudonym? Because we do know who that is. We know who not really. Jane Martin We're is We're just now. guessing. No, it's, it's, not, not, it's, it's not, not really public knowledge. Is that true? Yeah. Well, then how do we know it? I think there's just a lot of people guessing on the internet um, that it is a, a certain person. Really? I thought th- I thought this was no. was a done deal that no, we knew. No, even on, like, if you look on the, because it, it was up for the Pulitzer, I yeah. think it was a Pulitzer finalist. It was a finalist, yeah. Yeah, I under the Pulitzer finalist, it doesn't put in in brackets or parentheses that this the person, suspected playwright. you know, that Jane Martin is this particular person. Well, so, I don't want to spread the rumor then, if that's if Yeah, that's true. I don't feel comfortable saying who we think it is. Okay, wow, I really did believe that Yeah, that so Jane Martin is knowledge. a pseudonym. Okay. Okay, well, <laughs> for we, those of you who don't know. We can say that, yes. Jane, it was not written, it was written by Jane Martin under a, a pseudonym. And just a little side note, because, um, I, you know, I teach women's playwrights at, yeah. at, uh, at UNLV, I had always just assumed that Jane Martin was Jane Martin, but there is a, an idea floating around that that person who um, actually wrote the play is actually a man. Uh, and I was using it as ammunition for my <laughs> for my women's playwrights class, and n- now I, I don't really feel like I comfortable can. Comfortable doing that. So you well, you heard me rant a little bit about, mm-hmm. about being a, a white guy and feeling uncomfortable sort of taking over the discussion on this subject. Adrian, I'm going to ask you, would that, does it matter? Would it matter that the playwright turns out to be some white guy somewhere? I don't think it has to matter, yeah. but I do think it does matter in this play because so, I feel like this play is written from a male, more of a male perspective. Really? Mm-hmm. In, in what way? Uh, there's a lot of things about the female experience that I don't think are represented particularly well. Huh. Um, for instance, like morning sickness, you know, uh-huh. she doesn't have any of that. Um, the the way she's written kind of um, hostile uh-huh. in a way um, is, I don't think, indicative of, I think that's a male's perspective. A, a on masculine it, reaction right, to it. Yeah. To it. Um, and I think the male character is so overbearing that I don't feel like, a woman would have written a man that way. Well, that's interesting. I, I, I'm, I'm <laughs> glad you. I'm glad that's you my that opinion. Up. I mean, well, no, I'm glad you brought that up because yeah. I, I. So to be really, to, uh, big spoiler alert. So uh, Keely is is raped and impregnated by an ex and has made it public that she is going to have an abortion, a very uh, extreme right wing branch of an anti abortion group, kidnap her drag her drugged to a basement where she wakes up chained to a bed where they intend to hold her until the period for viable abortion has has passed and she big will, spoiler alert oh no i warned them and there and <laughs> so there is no at that point then um she would be at the point where she could not right. uh, uh receive an abortion because they would have kept her for that long now that's that's a pretty that is a pretty provocative plot Bearing that in mind, and now what you just said about you know the anger of the of the men, the reaction of that imprisoned character, is there you know beyond that beyond that dogma, um, there's humanity in these characters, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, but you really have to dig for it. Okay. In my mind, like I think if if a regular person, and by that I mean someone who's not skilled or trained in reading plays, sure, were to pick this up and read it, I I don't know that they would pick up on that as easily. Right. Because I think it is really buried. But the more you delve into it, the more apparent it becomes. And well, then you see it sort of everywhere. Well, I'll just put on my Theater 101 hat real quick for a second and remind audiences of what you already know. As it plays, you know, are not meant to be read. Right. They're meant to be seen. They're meant to be experienced in, in some sort of production. Read to you, but not necessarily read. And there is a, a bit of a... Um, 
I don't know, a, a skill in doing that. Yeah, Emery, why don't you jump in? I saw that face. Yeah, and also uh, plays change as times change. So here we are in 2022, right, w looking through the play with this particular lens. So the way we uncover uh, the gems in the play might be different than the way the gems might have been uncovered in the 1990s. Sure. When was this play written? Remind me. In 1994. 94. Yeah, I was going to say 95. But and, and here we are talking about its its topicality again in 2022. Is that a fair word for this play, topical? Mm -hmm. Is topicality a word? Topicality yeah. is absolutely a word. <laughs> I dare you to look it up. I dare anyone to look it up. Tell know, me I'm wrong. I know you make up words. I, I have been There's known. There's a lot of people Googling right now. <laughs> I have been known to make up a word or two. <laughs> um, with, so, okay, well, is, is there a danger in, in topical plays? Is there a danger in presenting a play because of the current zeitgeist? I think that, yeah, especially if you're going in with agenda, there's an absolute danger of doing that. But from the beginning, when I was having conversations with Adrian, she knew right away that she didn't want to present a particular side. She wanted it to be, she wanted both sides presented so that the audience uh, would be left to make a decision. And the way to do that is to make uh, the characters human. If you go into a play, you know, wagging your arms in the air and you have your fists, you know, clenched, then you're not going to serve the story. Right. You're going to just serve a perspective. And then the play is going to be very preachy and very overwrought. And, and nobody really wants to be preached at in the theater. We want to see the human experience. Right. And, and so, yes, there is a danger if you have that sort of dangerous perspective. Is that a conversation you've had with the cast, Adrian? I'm certain that everyone, I mean, I, I can't imagine that you've gone through this process without having some sort of conversations about the politics beside and I can imagine I can see a, a you know I can see a situation where there may be discussions that break out amongst the cast about you know the dogma involved but you must have had some conversations about putting that to the side and and um, focusing on the the humanity and the relationship and the the connection between these characters oh absolutely I mean I don't think I mean for instance the the uh, gentleman who plays Walter does not agree with his character's position at all. So, um, and neither does the woman who's play who plays do. Yeah. Um, so what you mean, you don't have a couple of kidnappers involved in your <laughs> cast that, that right. uh, agree with the idea of kidnapping a woman and holding her against her will for a number of months. Not, not so far. That's in Las Vegas. <laughs> that is weird. That's weird. I got to take a second look at our acting corral. So it is, it is tricky because, you know, I mean, but that's the, you know, that's the thing about acting is even when you play a a villainous character or a character you don't share morals and ethics with, you still have to find something about that character that you admire and can relate to um, and be an advocate for. Um, and they've managed to do that. But yeah. certainly we've had conversations regarding that kind of stuff. We haven't really talked about our own personal beliefs and I think we have stayed away from that purposefully. Well, I would think so. Yeah, there's yeah. danger there, right? To to muddy those to to muddy the waters of rehearsal with with that level of, of political right back and forth. Right. I thought you were gonna you, you made that face again. Oh no, you just waste time too. You know, get, go down the rabbit hole of discussing politics versus right. rehearsing. Yeah. it's a waste of time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. That, that that that's absolutely fair. So what it, with that in mind, then what other traps are there in this? sort of material have you found, Adrian? Are there particular you know, landmines you're trying to skip over? And, and as Amory likes the term rabbit holes, any rabbit holes that you want to avoid going down in, in, in putting this type of play together? I think that's the biggest one. I yeah. mean, it, it's, and it's the most glaring one, um, is to make, as I started to say earlier, I feel like the playwright attempted to give equal weight to both sides in the, in the text, but um, it feels very skewed to me personally um, in the pro-choice uh, arena. Mm -hmm. So for me, the biggest challenge has been trying to give, you know, just as much importance to the left side or the uh, right side, the both conservative sides. right side. Yeah. Well, to try to bring that side up to oh, match. Oh, because the play feels a little bit tilted in yes, one direction. Yes, it feels very tilted pro-choice to me. It's, well, from it, the start, you put you, you, you cast right. the one side as, as literal kidnappers. I think I can see that danger. 
Right. Also, I think there is, uh, I think it's very difficult when you're an actor. Yeah. Uh, you know, you're up there and you're just going moment to moment and playing certain choices and you don't realize that maybe that your own perspective is skewing the perspective or skewing mm. the performance. Uh, That's a good point. Yeah, so you think you're serving the play by um, honoring your perspective and being an advocate of your perspective, but then you forget uh, in rehearsal that you're trying to, I'm being really ambiguous here, I'm trying to be a little bit more clear, um, you're really trying to get something from the other person, right? That's that's what we do in life. We try and get things from other people. Well, give, give us an acting 101 course real quick in terms of what you're exactly what you're talking about because you're talking about you're talking about um, uh, the way characters achieve their goals. Well, and, let, and we have words for that, right? We right. Use... Well, let, let's just talk in terms of Keeley's character. Okay? okay, this this particular character, she's kidnapped. She's chained to a bed, right? The tendency, and rightly so, would to be really upset that this is happening. And the sense of injustice uh, that this event is occurring to you personally. But if you play the injustice of that throughout the whole text, then the audience is going to um, not continue to pay attention well, to you. Yeah, and I would also argue that I don't know how I, as an actor, I don't know how I would play injustice. Well, you can just be mad the whole time. Yeah. Like, you're mad because this is happening to you, right? Sure. The, the injustice of it. Or you play the victim. Yeah. You play the victim. You play the victim. But really... If you're kidnapped, right, you're trying to get out. So you have to play the idea of survival. Like, how do I get out of here? How do I uh, make friends with this woman who's being so nice to me? Maybe she'll see my perspective. So you, you're actually trying to accomplish things. And that's really way more interesting to see where you win and lose those battles along the way versus just being mad that you're chained to a bed. And I think that that can be a trap because, of course, you would be mad. Sure. And, and that is the trap of the play. Uh, and, you know, uh, when we're storytellers, we often tell bad guys, well, you need to be the hero of your own story. Yes. So in the case of Walter, right, he could... There are aspects of the story where he is this preacher, right? And he, he's, he's preaching his perspective. But he also has to try and reach the woman that he's kidnapped. So he has to soften his perspective and soften his tone in order to reach her so that she'll agree to these conditions and be more pliable. Well, and that, that speaks to the idea of not pandering to one side of the dogma or the, or the other if you're playing those, that level of humanity in, 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 in someone. Right, and everybody that Adrian's cast is, they're so damn charismatic. Yeah, <laughs> it's you a know? good looking cast. They, well, they're charismatic, they're good looking, they're very talented. So if you can get them to play those more positive choices, then you can actually be wooed um, towards their perspective. And I think that's what needs to happen in society as well, right? Not that my perspective about abortion necessarily is going to is going to shift but i might have more compassion for the other side and and in why they're um why they think that way and that's what it means to have empathy is to have curiosity about other people's way of thinking and when we have curiosity about about other uh, then we can have conversations and then we're not shooting each other we're not protesting then we're passing laws that are helpful for all of society and not just our side and then we're working together because that's life nobody thinks the same way well, it sounds like you're talking about the goals of all theater the the idea that we're promoting just an empathic response to a side that we may not be familiar with or or um comfortable with or really understanding of until we've seen we've gone through the process with him you know in the in the audience of a play absolutely yeah so just a quick heads up for what we have in store here at a public fit we've been talking about gene martin's keely and do that will be presented on september 30th at seven o'clock over at the clark county library 1401 east flamingo road but that's just the start of this year's seasons of plays and staged Readings. Our first main stage show, Three Days of Rain by Richard Greenberg, opens October 14th and runs for four weeks over at the Super Summer Studio Theater at 4340 South Valley View. Seating for that one is limited, so I seriously suggest you know getting your tickets now. 
but you know, that's not all. Here's a, a quick rundown of what's coming up at APF. After three days of rain, it's back to the library for a reading of Alistair McDowell's Brilliant Adventures. Our second main stage show, An Oak Tree by Tim Crouch, takes us back to the Super Summer Studio Theater and then back to the library for Octavio Solis's Lydia. Our final main stage show is in partnership with the College of Southern Nevada. It's August Wilson's The Piano Lesson and will be presented in their amazing state-of-the-art black box at their Cheyenne campus. And finally, Audrey Cefali's Alabaster will close out the season with a stage reading back at the Flamingo Library. Stay tuned for uh, upcoming episodes of Behind the Buzz where you'll get even more information and even more conversations. We'll be talking with performers and directors, designers, and... You know, I'm pretty sure I can guarantee a playwright or two this year. So stay tuned. You know, we talked a little bit about the the, the state of Keeley in, in this play and sort of the, the the plot device that gets her there, the kidnapping, the, the the shackling. That makes me uncomfortable to even talk about. Is an audience going to be uncomfortable with that sort of uh, expression? I hope so. Really? So there's something to be said for an uncomfortable audience? Oh, absolutely. Tell me about that. I don't think we go to the theater for answers. I think we go to the theater to find new questions. Hmm. So being uncomfortable to me means there's something I need to ask. There's something I need to figure out. And if you if if you never show me uncomfortable, what's the point? You know what I mean? If, if yeah. Unless I'm going to, you know, a Cirque show or something where I just want to be entertained. But... I don't know. I went to see Zumanity. I was a little bit uncomfortable. I have to say. <laughs> There's a couple of moments. <laughs> um, and so you're looking forward to that, actually. That's something oh, that you're... Oh, sure. Okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, you've been to our... So you've been to our, our readings. You've seen mm-hmm. our shows. You've been involved with APF for a little while now. And you know that after all of our stuff, we we talk it up with the audience. They stick around and then and they buzz with us and we react to the material and we talk about the discoveries and the themes of, of the show. Where do you think those conversations are going to go for this one? Well, or you know what? I take that back. I, okay. I don't want you to prognosticate. Okay. Where do you hope those conversations go? I hope those conversations go to a place of um, questioning the stance that you came in with. Yeah, that's that's what I hope for. I mean, you know, going back to Aristotle and catharsis and all that kind of stuff. If you don't have an emotional reaction to something, it's not art. You know. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm okay with any question that's, that's posed, you know, but I'm, I'm just hoping that there are questions that indicate that people are opening their mind a little bit or considering other sides and and maybe some of the questions will not be questions, but statements, you know, I, I'm, this was interesting to me because I came in feeling this and now I have a little bit of, as Anne-Marie said, empathy or compassion for this. So, um, but you've come out on, I mean, you've gone on record now. This, I don't know if you realize this, but this is actually being recorded. Oh, no, yes, really? So, you're on the record. I thought we were just having, no, having a chat. This is in for posterity now. And you said that you, you hope the audience is uncomfortable. Is that a, I mean, is what, that, what, do you expect them to come in and be comfortable? I'm asking whether you think that's conducive to, to a conversation or whether it's, um, the idea of shaking them up so that they, uh, we can find new discoveries within themselves. I'm wondering what what being uncomfortable does for them, and what it does for what you what you just hope to if achieve. If something makes you uncomfortable, then there's something about that situation that you don't understand. Right. So if you don't understand it, you will have questions about it, and you begin to question yourself: Why is that making me uncomfortable? And then I think that's when you can become enlightened and aware. Yeah. So I think it's very important to experience discomfort. I, I like it. Well, I don't. I think. Well, no, I, I agree with you because I think that that sometimes you know, and there is a there is an audience out there that is interested in just safe, you know, really interesting productions of you know the odd couple. That um, uh, there is an audience out there. I don't know that that's the audience that we've created though. And what do you think? No, every play that we choose, you know, is is to raise questions, to have a public fit, yeah, to create a conversation. Right there, we gave everybody fair warning. Yeah, I think we're going to have a bit of a tantrum with this one, um, and I wouldn't be surprised uh, that if we have a couple of people come in right from the get go, whose um, arms are crossed and really ready mm-hmm. to get into a fight. Uh, and we might have to be prepared for that. Yeah. You know. Uh, but I, I hope they, I mean, I hope 
we have been successful, at least to an extent, where anyone who would come in feeling that way would at least see that we tried to present the opposing view as equally as we could so that they don't feel like it was a, a slam in, you know, a slap in their face. I don't know how they could not think that because the way we ended last season with Heroes of the Fourth Turning where most of the, the story was about um, about the, the more conservative perspective and, and really examining the con- conservative perspective. And there was a whole discussion about abortion in that play. And we, we put that conversation out there. Uh, so we're not afraid to present different sides, right? Um, I, 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 I can what say was, that with a whole heart that, <laughs> that we, um, we're, we're trying to do that. Yeah. There's, a, there's another challenge, um, aside from just the material itself, and I, I, you know, you've had some uh, directing experience, um, you know, Adrian, in your, in your career. I don't know if, if this is your, I think, first staged reading, and that brings its own challenges itself. You know, for the longest time, we would sort of say, well, we have these full-scale productions, and this one is just a reading. And we've stricken the word just from those from those conversations anymore. And when we talk to directors that are coming in to do these, we don't use the word just a reading anymore. But we are clear that there are there are parameters that a that a reading has that perhaps a full scale production um, doesn't have. And and I've used it recently I've used the comparison of someone saying, well it's it's just a poem as opposed to a novel. Well it's not just a poem, it's a a poem and a poem has its own, you know, rules and and, and, and parameters. How do you feel about the the parameters of a of a stage reading? Is there are there challenges there as a director that that are uh, impossible to sort out, or or do you accept those challenges and, and embrace them? I'm working on accepting them. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, it's it can be fr- it can be frustrating. I I guarantee. Yeah, you that. and it's only frustrating. I mean, I think it depends on your director. But for me, I'm kind of a perfectionist oh. and and a little bit of a control freak. Yeah. So I want everything perfect. Sure. And uh, you don't always get that. Matter of fact, you <laughs> don't usually get that. So well, any, you're in the wrong business. Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> in, any process to me has its frustrations. Sure. But um, I haven't found this one to be near as frustrating as I first imagined it might be. Oh, yeah, really? So, no, because the support of the staff here and the producers and everything has been incredible. So, uh, you know, when I've put forth an argument for something I want, you guys have agreed and tried to make it happen. So... You know that makes the process so much easier for me, and I yeah. and I do understand the parameters of what I'm what I'm working with. Sure, but I still want to put on a full, fully developed, thought out, you know, um, production in terms of the acting and the the quality of that. Oh, sure, and our and our so. stage readings have have stumbled into a level of of greatness that uh, has surprised even me. You made a face again. I saw that face. Well. What are we in our ninth season now? Yeah. And so the way APF started actually was with stage readings and all of the things that you are facing now, uh, Joe and I have faced over and over and over again until we realize the different parameters of a stage reading versus a fully uh, produced reading. In fact, the first stage reading that we did uh, was Belleville. Uh, <laughs> are you going to tell this story? Yeah, really? sure, I'm going to tell this story. So we had it's, 10 it's days of rehearsal. Jump in with both feet. We had 10 days of rehearsal, and I I thought, okay, I'm going to fully stage this. It's going to have full props. I have great actors. So I, I did. I staged the whole thing. They were, they were clipping along. The day before uh, we opened, it was a great show. But the, the mistake that I made was I tried to shove – a whole steak, an undigested steak, <laughs> down yeah. the throat of four actors, and they were not able to chew the material. Over the course of 10 rehearsals. Over the course of 10 rehearsals. So when they got in front of an audience, right, right. <laughs> they, vomited they vomited that, that steak, steak right back <laughs> up, and they were they faced were with face- certain challenges. The rhythms were off. It wasn't the same rehearsal the day before as... Um, in the privacy of the producing team as it was in front of the audience. And I learned in real time in front of an audience that you can't do that to actors. You can't force them to remember all of those things because they have to have their process. They have to be able to um, multitask and multitasking for an actor 
comes in in degrees of layering. It's like layering skin so that they can wear that character. So over the course of these nine years, Joe and I have learned how we've made a lot, a lot of mistakes along the way. So we try five. We made five <laughs> mistakes. <laughs> we right, but we've learned from them. And so what we try and do is we try and pass those those learning experiences on uh, to the director. But that being said. You still have to go through the process and figure it out yourself and have your aha moments. Well, I think, yeah. I mean, uh, to, to be fair, too, all things being equal, I think if you had your, your choice, we would just do stage readings for the rest of our... But you, you really find the benefit in, in stage readings and the... the I love stage readings. The challenges re of them uh, are, are very different. From, you want to talk about the difference between what the challenges are in a stage reading as opposed to a fully realized production, where you find the, well, the most benefit? In a fully realized production, right, by the time you get there, you're adding all the tech and yeah. and it's you're you're adding like all all of this magic on top of it to really um sell it. Yeah, to sell it. Right. And and suspend people's uh you know, believe in the make believe. Sure. Right. But with a stage reading, you're really focusing on the story. Like what is the story? And so it's your opportunity as a director to kind of sketch out that story and figure out, well, what, what really are the main themes of the story that I, as a director, like to highlight? Because I can't rely on all of this tech in order to massage the story, right? I can't, that's not going to help me because there's very little tech. So there's a rawness to it, but there's also like an honesty to it, too, because then you can really see the strength of the script, the strength of your actors, your, the strength of your directing, how, um, how you lead people, how you work moments, all of those things come into play. Well, it was, and it was really last season where we really committed to, we upped the budget of the mm -hmm. stage readings. We started to throw a little bit of money at them. We brought in conceptualized set design, conceptualized uh, costuming, conceptualized props to sort of help uh, make some of those moments. I think this speaks to what you're talking about. Right, but you know how when you read the story and it, it's in your head and it's very abstracted, yeah. right? And you're seeing, in my head, I'm seeing these abstracted images or feelings or sounds or thoughts or sensations. And then you get the, you get the material up on its feet and you're like, oh, that's what the story is. Uh, and so then you can really see in real time with a stage reading how attached you are to the script. Yeah. Right. And then what happens is if a public fit is really attached to the strip and they script and they really believe in the script, oftentimes we'll take that stage reading and we'll we'll turn it in into a fully realized production so that we can add that layer of massaging the story and magic, the spectacle of theater. Uh, and that's that's what I appreciate about um, the stage reading. It, it helps me really see what the story is with this particular group that I'm working with. Yeah. Well, and they're still free. I mean, we're still offering them free to the public, which sort of allows us to, to jack up our prices for the other shows. A <laughs> well, yeah, it takes the pressure off of me as a, as a director. I, yeah. I usually, when I'm rehearsing a stage reading, I was like, well, yeah, sure, let's do this. Why not? Let's, let's do this. <laughs> Let, let's experiment here, you know? Does, does any of that speak to you, Adrian? Have you found that with the, with the idea of a stage reading that it, it allows you some flexibility in, in creativity and some flexibility in... And, um, how you approach working with, with, with actors? Or do you feel hemmed in? I don't feel either of those things. Oh, well, then tell me what you feel. Um, I mean, uh, first to Anne Marie's point, I, I, I think she hit the nail on the head with the fact of stage readings. There's, there's very little other distractions yeah. to focus on. So you do just focus right, you know, on the heart of the text. Um, but I don't, I don't find I'm not him. I, I'm neither of those things. Yeah. I'm just I'm just happy to be working with him. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, really. I, no, I believe you. I, I <laughs> and I agree. Well, I've I've come to really enjoy not just watching the stage, not just uh, you know being involved as, as a director producer on these things, but watching them. I think is has been a real um, education to me in in how you know you, you can really quickly determine how strong a script is. Um, when it's just you know on its feet in a stage reading with a, a, a few really strong actors telling the story without the idea that you have to land the helicopter, you know, on the on the stage. Or, I mean, that's or how storytelling began, right? It, I yeah. mean, around the campfire, and there weren't all of these other accoutrements. Well, and it, again, it's about those conversations and about the stories that that spark 
um, those conversations. And I, I'm now remembering, Emery, early on when we first started this, you used a phrase about um, um, quiet conversations or fragile conversations. I don't remember what it was. I'll have to go back and listen. In this to conversation? In this I... conversation. I told you to remember this so we could talk about it Oh, what more. was that? Do you remember that phrase? I don't remember. I don't remember. Yeah, what was, is it? I don't know. It was something about uh, um, calm, in calm tones. And I'm wondering if, if, if this is a play that will allow for calm conversations if we if we if we get into the buzz and this will be a it depends uh, on our audience and yeah that really depends on who shows up and what frame of mind they're in and what happens in the news that day sure <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, that we did uh i'll just remind everyone we opened um heroes of the fourth turning on literally on the day when roe v wade was was uh overturned oh, wow. yeah it was a and our actors were moment. scared to death to get on. They felt very fragile. Well, that's a question too, Adrian. Do you, do you feel like your actors, are they bringing in some armor into this production? Do they feel like it's them versus an audience? Or do they feel like there's an opportunity for them to be attacked for not just their characters, but their characters' point of view? You know, that's something we haven't discussed at all and maybe should. Um, but they don't appear to be it doesn't sound like you're worried it sounds like you're looking forward to the <laughs> to the controversy and to the talk well and to i the... wouldn't say i'm looking forward to it but i'm i'm willing to accept it yeah you know what i mean it's you know sure it, it, well, it's endemic to the to right. the play i think um i don't i know that there have been a few private conversations with some of the actors and and the way the script has affected them yeah or made them view something differently oh, that's um, interesting and uh, i don't want to say too much but i know for me and one other actor we talked about how as we get older and age sort of giving it away aren't i um anyway how our views have sort of softened on on this topic yeah. in, in different ways um so i think change is possible you know and i think eyes can be opened and I, I do think they have thought about this. We haven't had, like I said, had a ton of conversations about it. But I do feel that they bring in different things as, as we've worked further and further on the play and getting deeper into it and what it means. Um, I feel like they are experiencing feelings about sure. it. And I understand you don't want to speak for them, but that's right. your impression of the... Right of the room yeah all right i thanks for coming and chatting up chatting us up about about this i'm looking forward to the reading i hope you're excited about it are you nervous are you proud are you scared to death all of the above excellent that's as fantastic. you should be that's fantastic that's fantastic well i think we're off to a fine start to season number three of uh of behind the buzz another another great conversation and i want to again thank adrian for joining us and, and starting uh, what I think will undoubtedly uh, be a very compelling conversation. Uh, if you're out there listening right now, uh, and I guess I don't know who I'm talking to if you're, if you're not, but I, I, I hope you've subscribed and I hope you've taken the time to give us a quick podcast review. You know, your, your feedback allows us to build upon these conversations the same way that we, we build a season um, and allows us to fine-tune the approach to this, this podcast. You can also connect with us through the emails by writing us at behindthebuzz at apublicfit.org. We love talking about the work and uh, we love it when you join us for these, for these conversations. Behind the Buzz is a product of a public theater company. It is directed by Anne-Marie Pereth and me, Joe Kukin, and is recorded, mixed, and edited by the amazing Diane Walton.